Story Hinge, Episode 79, Mike Robbins. Enjoy today. You start hearing someone's story, and even if the story itself is super different than your story, what's not different is the emotional experience of it. Because what's infused in all of our stories, joy, pain, excitement, sadness, insight and wisdom, difficulty, fear, all of that, the whole spectrum of human experience, right, is in our story. And when we share our story authentically, I'm like, wow, your story is way different than my story. But you know what? There's a lot of feelings in your story that are the same feelings in my story. That's where we have all that common ground. And I think the one thing I would say in the midst of all of this, whether we're talking about bringing our whole selves to work or connecting with people that may seem different or not different than us, I also just think it's really important for us to be kind and compassionate to ourselves. Because I really believe like we don't actually see other people as they are, we see them as we are. So the kinder and more compassionate we are with ourselves, the kinder and more compassionate we tend to be with other people. All right. Hello out there. Welcome to Story Hinge. So glad you're here with us. Um, so, so grateful for all of you that have been tuning in for to Story Hinge. You know, we've been on going on past a year and a half and looking forward to, to continuing. For those of you that have been paying attention, you'll know that I haven't released a podcast in the last three weeks. And that's unusual. I've been pretty faithful all through these t- these year and a half to have a podcast every week. And the reason for that, a couple of reasons, I guess. The first is that my family and I, we moved houses out here in Houston. So changing houses and getting into a new house took quite a bit of time and resource. And and to be honest, there's uh, there's probably time I could have completed some of these podcasts and released them, but um, I just didn't have the energy on some of those days. And uh, for all of you that know that what, what moving is like and so we're a little bit more settled in now. There's still quite a few boxes that still need to go through and a garage that needs to be organized and and that sort of thing. And so that was one of the reasons. The other was that my brother and I started a new podcast, a new podcast called 73 Mentors. And I want to invite you guys to check that out. Uh, that's the number 73mentors.com for the website. And then for the podcast, you can search, search 73 Mentors, one word, and you'll see that should pop up for you. And let me tell you a little bit about, about that work, and, and I'm really excited about it. I think it's it's inspired by StoryHinge and the work that we've been doing here. Uh, for those of you that have been around for a while, back at episode 40, my brother joined me and we talked about the story of oil. And it was really just a discussion as we, we both researched about oil and, and fossil fuels to some some degree. And then we sat down and had this discussion together about what we found. And to this day, that still re- remains to be one of the, the most popular episodes here on Story Hinge. And so what 73 Metros is, is taking a little bit of that format, right? So my brother and I are discussing topics. And what we're discussing is the 73 most influential people who have ever lived. The top ones who have impacted this world in the biggest way. And going to dive into their lives, into their work, um, to spend weeks and months researching these different individuals. And then sitting down together and talking about that. We are already well on our way. We released uh, three, three, four, po- four episodes already. And we are talking about Plato. And specifically Plato's Republic, uh, which is his most popular work. And going through that week by week, taking it a book at a time. And having a pretty good discussion. It's been really fun on, on my side. I think uh, the reception out there so far for those who have given us feedback is very positive. And I think it would be appeal to a lot of you out there. It has some of the elements of Story Hinge in terms of learning new things from people. But I think it's a, it's a format that we, we, we dive deeper. It's uh, more research-backed. And um, I guess on a personal side, I get to reveal more of my own self through that discussion. But here, things here on Story Hinge are going to keep moving. Um, they're not going away. We're going to... I've committed to keep releasing an episode at least every other week. So I'm going to pull back the load a little bit here to allow for some more time and resources to to 73 mentors, but we're going to keep producing great content. And I'm actually, I think I'm on this place now where we're, in terms of the interviews and the people that I've had on recently, I, I feel like it's getting way better than it was. And I, and I guess I guess you guys are the judges of that, but at least from my perspective, I'm so excited about some of the people I've talked to recently and some of the people I'm lining up here on StoryHinge. 
So there's a little bit of uh, what's been going on here in my world. I hope things are going out well for all of you out there. I really feel like there's some great things to offer here on Story Hinge and 73 Mentors. And I'll I'll put that link also in the, the show notes and on on the website so we have some cross-linking there. That's enough for me today. Why don't we get into our show? I'm so excited to have on today Mike Robbins. Now, Mike Robbins is an author who has just come out with his fourth book called Bring Your Whole Self to Work. And that just came out at the beginning of May. And Mike is an expert in teamwork, leadership, emotional intelligence, and delivers keynotes and seminars around the world to empower people, leaders, and teams to engage in their work. Through his speeches and seminars, consulting and writing, Mike teaches important techniques that allow individuals and organizations to be more appreciative, authentic, and effective. And with all that, Mike, welcome to Story Hinge. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about um, several different things. Uh, but first, we always like to jump back in time a bit and hear a little bit of your own story and how you, some of those, I guess, pivotal moments that brought you up to where, where you're at today. Yeah, gosh. Well, you know, like most of us, I've got a few moments along the way that have been pivotal for sure. And some more uh, challenging and more defining than others. You know, I grew up um, in Oakland, California, where I still live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so not that far from where I grew up. I live over in the other side of the Bay in Marin County now. But um, my folks split up when I was three. My older sister was seven. And uh, that was a huge defining moment. You know, obviously, I didn't understand what was happening at the time, but it was big because, you know, my mom ended up raising me and my older sister, Lori, as a single mom. Um, and you know, she struggled financially and I, you know, my real outlet for my passion and all my energy, I was a very energetic kid was sports. I loved playing sports and particularly baseball. And I was, I was pretty good at baseball. I actually got drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees. Wow. I didn't end up uh, signing a contract with the Yankees at that time. Cause I got an opportunity to play baseball in college at Stanford university. I went to Stanford, played baseball there, which was quite a cool experience, got to pitch in the College World Series, and then um, I ended up getting drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals, and I did sign with the Royals at that time, and the way that it works in baseball, as many people listening probably know, you get drafted by a major league team, whether it's the Royals or the Yankees or the Astros or any of the teams, you got to go into what's called the minor leagues, and uh, you know, you got to work your way up through the minor league system, get to the major leagues, and I, unfortunately, my third season, in the, still in the minors with Kansas City, I went out to pitch one night and I threw one pitch and I tore ligaments in my elbow mm. and I blew my arm out. Mm. I was 23 at the time. I had started playing baseball when I was seven and, uh, you know, I spent the next two years having surgeries. I had three surgeries on my arm after I got hurt and tried to come back, wasn't able to make it back. So I was forced to, forced to retire from baseball when I was 25. And well, let me tell you, let ask you what that was like and going, yeah, going through that in, in, in that moment. Cause you know, there's a, a shift in your path. You know, I'm sure Huge. you had expectations to be a major leaguer and, and yeah. go big and yeah. And were you on that I mean, path to be that? Do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of my, you know, my friends and my contemporaries at the time, I mean, that's what we were doing and, you know, playing at Stanford and then being in the minor leagues of Kansas city. I mean, I still had a few steps in the process to get there, but, uh, you know, that was the plan and that was the goal. And, you know, it was sort of felt like overnight, even though it wasn't an overnight thing, it just sort of went away. And, it was really difficult. I, um, but I learned a ton from that. I mean, and I think this is, you know, you know, this given the work that you do and talking to people about their stories. I mean, sometimes I think some of the most painful, challenging aspects of our story of our lives, you know, can be really hard at, t at the time we're going through it. And then as we move through it and look back, we go, Oh, now I understand why that happened or that makes sense. You know, for me, the big realization at that time was, when I look back on the whole experience and I was trying to work through it and figure out what am I going to do next and, you know, where am I at and what's life all about for me right now. And I, I remember thinking, you know, asking myself the question as I looked back on the whole experience of, you know, starting baseball at seven and playing all those years was like, did I have any regrets? You know, would I do anything over again if I could? And I didn't really regret a lot of the, you know, mistakes I made or games I blew or stuff I got all stressed out about when I was playing. The only regret that I had was that I didn't fully appreciate it while it was happening, right? I was this kid raised by a single mom. We didn't have a lot of money. I was going to make it to the major leagues. I was going to make some money. I was going to, you know, be important. But up to that point in my life, even though I was pretty good, I spent most of my time thinking that I wasn't good enough 
comparing myself to everyone around me and literally like holding my breath, hoping that I didn't mess it up. And when it was all said and done and I hadn't made it, I thought to myself, oops, I think I missed the point. That's interesting. What was that since your youth, you kind of had that, that comparison that I'm not good enough thing or what, what do you think that came from? That's a good question. I mean, I, part of me thinks at some level, I mean, look, we're all different, of course, but I, I think it's part of being human. Um, I mean, I think my personality is such that, you know, I'm, I've always been a relatively confident person and at the same time, very much in touch with my own insecurity and my own vulnerability. And one of the things I think I, I realize now that I've had a chance over the last number of years to work with athletes in particular, uh, and most of the work I do is in the corporate world, it's not with athletes, but when I do work with athletes, I realize, oh, I just bought into this notion as many of us do when we're younger that like, I got to suck it up. I got to be tough. This is particularly for us men. I mean, women have a different version of this in a lot of cases, but it's like, you're not supposed to admit any fear, any doubt, any insecurity. And so I just think that in those competitive environments, it's very difficult not to fall into the trap of comparison, but at the same time, not a lot of people talk about it. So like, I thought I was crazy, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? I'm like, oh, maybe there's something wrong with me. Cause you know, the crazy part was, I mean, even as a kid, like I, I mean, just as an example, not to sound too arrogant about it, I was like, you know, I'm 12 years old, I'm playing little league and I'm like the best player on the team by far. And I still would find myself feeling nervous and insecure and like, uh, and you know, everyone's looking at me like, you're really good. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I know. And like, I, I'm still nervous. And, and again, I didn't have anybody at the time explain to me like that's part of being human. Like it's okay to feel nervous. It's okay to feel anxious. It's okay. Even if you're excited, even if you're good at something and like, that's part of the deal. And I, I think as a culture, we're getting a little bit better at teaching our, you know, I have, my wife and I have two girls who are 12 and, and nine. And I mean, look, there's still a lot of things we could do a heck of a lot better as parents and in our culture, but explaining to, at least in some way to, to young people that, you know, the, the idea of being emotionally aware and emotionally intelligent is important. And, you know, a lot of the work that I do in the corporate world these days focuses a lot on emotional intelligence as well. So, you know, anyway, I mean, for me back to sort of my story, it was like, it was a pivotal moment but it taught me a lot. And the thing that I remember taking away from that experience, Jason was like, all right, I don't know what's coming next in my life, but whatever it is, I want to make sure I don't miss the experience by focusing so much on where I'm headed. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that, you know, led, I came back home. This was like, you know, I mean, I'm 44 now, so this was almost 20 years ago, but I moved back to the Bay area where I still live now. And I got a job working in the uh, dot com world, the internet sort of tech boom was happening in the late nineties. And I got a job working for a company here in San Francisco, based in New York, but has San Francisco sales office. And then went to another startup, uh, that was based in Seattle, but had a San Francisco sales office. And, you know, we were all going to get rich because the company was supposed to go public and it was going to be great. And then the dot com bubble burst and I lost my job. No. <laughs> so, you know, now I'm like 26 going on 27 and like, okay, I've worked for a couple of years but like still don't really know what I want to be when I grow up now that the baseball thing ended. But one of the things that I was really interested in as an athlete that I then became even more interested in when I got into the business world was like, and and everybody listening, whether you've ever played team sports or not, you've all been, we've all had experience of being part of a team where the talent on the team was good, but the team wasn't very good. Right. And we've also, we've also all had the experience of being part of a team or a group where it's not like every single person in the group is a rock star in and of themselves but something about the group or the team just kind of works. And this was true in sports and baseball. We call it chemistry, right? You have good chemistry or bad, you know, when you have it, you definitely know when you don't have it. And it was like this palpable, not just this like warm, fuzzy, touchy feeling. It's like this palpable thing that was intangible, but had a huge impact on the success or failure of each of us on the team and the team as a whole. And I had erroneously thought that was a sports thing. And as soon as I got into the business world, I realized, oh, that's not a sports thing. That's a human thing. Hmm. In business, we call it culture. Yeah. It's basically the same thing. And so I started studying that. I got really fascinated by that. And that's actually what led me to start my consulting business 17 plus years ago when I was, you know, just before my 27th birthday, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to speak and write and try to share my story and what I've learned, even though I was pretty young at the time with anybody who will listen. And if I can help some people out and some teams and some, 
you know, the other thing I'd noticed, by the way, on an individual level, it wasn't always the most talented people that were the most successful and it wasn't always the most successful people that were the most fulfilled. So I was really curious about that in my own life. Like, what does mm. success really mean and how do I define that in a way that's healthy? And then how do I actually live a life where I'm fulfilled because, you know, focusing on all the external stuff, which I had done for most of my life up to that point, didn't seem to be working in terms of having me feel really good about myself and my life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sounds, as I'm listening to you, it sounds like you're, these, these questions are, you start exploring into these questions and, yes. and, and it sounds like you start turning it into part of your career as, as part of right away. And I, I'm kind of curious about that is because some of those questions don't seem like they really lead to necessarily lead to a business. How did you start crafting that as you well, were exploring it? That's a good question. I mean, I think what happened, I was trying to sort myself out just, you know, here I was going through this big transition with baseball and, you know, how do I recover from that? And then, you know, what's my life about and who am I? If I'm not a baseball player, that had been so much of my identity from the time I was, you know, it's not that often that you're, when you're, you're 25, you've spent 18 of the first 25 years of your life focused on one activity that you're really good at, which I was. So it defined me in a way and not having that it was scary, but there was also an interesting part of it that was kind of exciting, even though I didn't know what was next. And so I got, you know, I had to get a job. So I, right, I'm working in the tech world, but I got really interested in personal growth and, and asking these questions in my own sort of, you know, spiritual journey and spiritual path. You know, like I grew up, my, my, my mom was raised Catholic. My dad was raised Jewish, neither of them very religious. Um, you know, my parents split up, as I mentioned, when I was three and we actually ended up going to a Lutheran church in the neighborhood because my mom wanted some community and she didn't really want to go back to the Catholic church, but the Lutheran church was sort of close enough and she mm -hmm. felt, you know, and so, but, but I never really felt a connection through that. And I, you know, I went through first communion confirmation, all, but it always, it, it didn't feel real to me. I couldn't like, what is this? I don't understand all the rules and the doctrine. I, I like, I want some, you know, but, but by the time I got to college, I actually started to have more of an, a real yearning for some spiritual connection and what does that mean and what does God mean and what do I believe and you know and, and trying to sort some of that stuff out myself and as I went through my experience with baseball I just had deeper questions about life that I wanted to explore and so a long way to answer your question about how I turn that into a business what started to happen was I started to see some practical application of these things in my own life, my own personal and kind of spiritual work. And then as I was mentioning that whole sort of team dynamic thing, there were a few people that came in when I was working in the tech world that come in to speak or they'd come in to, you know, sort of inspire us at a meeting or at the conference. And I, I kept thinking like, how do you get that job? I want that job. Like, like what qualifies you to be someone who then coaches or counsels or inspires other people, either personally or perfect. Like I just, and then I started like going into the bookstore. I just wander into bookstores and I'd pull out all these like self-help books and sometimes even business books and just and spiritual, whatever books. And I'm like, what was I drawn to? And I'd start reading and immediately as excited about the material as I would often be, I'd be like, who is this person who wrote this book and how did they figure out how to do that? And who, you know what I mean? Like, and so that was kind of, you know, and when I got laid off in the summer of 2000, when the NASDAQ had crashed and the dot-com bubble burst, I had a mentor of mine ask me a question. He said, Mike, if you could do anything, anything, it didn't matter. Your bills were paid. It was all taken care of. But like, what would you do? It's a great question, by the way, for us to ask ourselves all the time. But especially at that moment in my life, in my, you know, mid-20s when I was a little lost and confused, I said, well, if I didn't have to worry about paying the bills, I was like, I would write, I would speak, I would coach and counsel people. I would just share my story. And I would just keep going deeper into my own personal growth and development and try to help people along their path wherever they were. And he was like, wow, you seem really clear. Like you should go do that. And I'm like now. And he's like, well, yeah, what are you waiting for? And I'm like, well, cause I'm 26 and like, I don't know anything and I don't know how to do this. And like, <laughs> I have to pay the rent and like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? And, uh, he said, look, Mike, you could wait till you think you figured it out or you could just start now and figure it out yourself. Yeah. That's good. And that was, you know, and, and then a few months later, I met Michelle, who's my wife now, and we've been together for close to 18 years. And Michelle had started her own business. She had a staffing company at the time and was starting to get into life coaching herself. And she was like, oh, you could totally start your own business. You could do this. So I decided at the beginning of 2001, I, I, I was having a terrible time finding a job because the economy was really bad at the time, especially in the tech world here 
in the Silicon Valley, San Francisco area. And I decided I was getting some advice. People were like, oh, go back to school, get a master's or a, you know, PhD in psychology or in organizational development. Or, and I, I like to learn, but I didn't really ever like school. So I was like, I don't really want to go back to school unless I absolutely have to. But I decided in 2001, I was like, I am going to design my own curriculum is what I called it. Meaning I'm going to take whatever workshops and seminars were interesting to me that I could afford. I was going to find books and, and audio programs, you know, tapes at the time, cassette tapes <laughs> that was a while ago, you know, or even <laughs> CDs. I would listen, whatever I could listen to. I was just going to immerse myself with as much insight and wisdom and information as I could that I found useful to me. And then I was going to try to figure out how could I share some of these ideas in, in my own version and, and add my own story to it, if you will. And, and hopefully, you know, I got some training. I went to the Coaches Training Institute um, to get some training in life and business coaching. But then I just was like, you know, I said to someone, I mean, it, it, it's like, imagine if you're someone who loves going to the gym and working out, like that's your thing. That's totally your gig. You just hang out at the gym. You're sort of a gym rat. And if, if you're someone who does that, it would make sense to then be a personal trainer, right? Like, yeah. cause then you be at the gym, you learn all this stuff, you're working out, you're helping other people work out. You're just in that all day. You don't have to like go to work and then go to the gym. I said to someone at one point, I was like, I want to be like a trainer, but like a life trainer. And this was, you know, life coaching has become really big in the last 20 years, but life coaching was still kind of an unknown thing at the time. I was like, I want to just keep learning about myself and about life, about groups and teams and relationships and leadership and all these things I think are important. And the more I learn, I just want to sh share it with other people and maybe help them and like, I want that to be my, what I do for a living, not just what I do on the side because I'm interested. So, you know, that first year was pretty lean as I figured it would be, but I figured if I went to grad school, I was probably going to be broke and go into debt anyhow. So <laughs> that's kind of what happened the first couple of years I started the business, but I got fortunate. I was really lucky. There were a number of companies here in the Bay Area in particular, companies like Wells Fargo and Chevron and Kaiser who were based here who were now hiring a bunch of people around my age at the time, late 20s, early 30s. And they were having culture challenges inside their companies at the time. How do baby boomers and Gen Xers work together? And people who'd worked in the tech dot com world are now integrating into more traditional companies. And I was able to kind of hustle my way and network. And some of these companies started bringing me in to give talks and work with groups on some of these issues. And I was just sharing my story as an athlete personally and also what I'd learned about teamwork. And it started to sort of turn into some ideas, some concepts, some programs that I could deliver that seemed like they were valuable to people. And that's really how my business started. Okay. Well, I imagine there's been a lot of, you know, evolution through the, through the years. Cause this is back a few years. I guess yeah, my, my question is like, cause it's pretty broad when I, when I think about all the, all the things that you can talk about and yep. you, you, you played with, what, what are some of the things that really stand out to you? Or when you look out in the world, you say, Hey, like, this, these are the, some of the biggest needs from, from your experience and what you've seen. Gosh, that's a great question. I think, I mean, I think one big need, is perspective. You know, I, I mean, again, it connected to story and my own story. It's like the story that I shared just a few minutes ago about my journey through baseball and what I learned from it. I, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've told that story. And I don't, I mean, I share it because it's my personal story and it gives people a sense of me and my journey, but I share it because I think there's something universal in that story. Look, when I'm standing on stage in front of a group and I tell that story, I often say, how many of you can relate in your own life to this, right? To like not appreciating what you have until it's gone. And of course, everybody in the room raises their hand. Now, the, the vast majority, if not every single person in almost every room that I talk to, they didn't play pro baseball and hurt their arm. And right, that's not their story, like the specifics, but the, the notion of like, oops, I forgot to appreciate it. And now it's gone. That's a human thing. And so what I see in our, in our world today, both in the business world where I do a lot of my work, but also just in life in general is I think it's easy for us to lose perspective. I was in a taxi cab actually in Houston a number of years ago and uh, I was talking to the cab driver and we were just sort of making small talk and right before we got to the, uh, the airport I asked him, hey, where are you from originally? And he said, he told me he was from Ethiopia. I said, really? I've never been to Ethiopia, never been to Africa. I mean, I've traveled quite a bit in the last few years, but never made it there. And at this time, this was about 10, 11 years ago. And I was having this conversation and I'm not sure what prompted me to ask him this question. He had told me during the conversation that he'd been in, you know, he lived in Houston. He'd been there for like 20 years. He, his sons were born there and he's an American citizen. He was really proud to let me know that. And I said, what's your perspective on this culture? You know, American culture, given that you didn't grow up here. 
and he didn't say anything. I asked him that. He didn't, he didn't respond at first. I thought maybe I offended him. I, but we were right at the airport. He pulled the cab in. He put it in park. He turned around. He looked me right in the eye, and he said, can I be honest with you? And I said, sure. He said, I think most people in this culture act like spoiled brats. And I said, really, why do you say that? He said, Mike, I'm from Ethiopia. Every day, here's a good day. Mm. And I was like, whoa, man. I mean, I had literally just given an hour-long speech at Chevron in Houston on appreciation. <laughs> but this man said this really simple but profound thing to me in that taxi cab that day. And I was like, thank you. And I paid him. I got out of the cab and I thought to myself, man, that's a really important perspective, right? And I, so that's a long way of me saying, I think one of the things that can happen in our world today, not just in the U.S., it's other places too, but in our Western world, and I know my life experience and what I see, I, I spend most of my time here in the United States, is that it's so easy to compare ourselves to each other, to think, I should be there, I should be here, I should be there. Oh, look at that. You know what I mean? Like with all of the information and media and social media and everything coming at us, it's easy to think we're not doing enough or we're not good enough or whatever, when in reality it's like, how often do we just take a step back and look at our lives and even with some of the challenges go, wow, it's pretty good right now. How do you think we do that better? Because it's, you know, intellectually I can see that concept, right? Yeah. But to live in that moment, to have that, that, I guess that's really a level of gratitude and perspective and, and it just, it'll be so empowering to have that with you more all the time. Yes. How do you do it's that? A pra- it's a practice. You know, I mean, a couple things I do, like I've been carrying with me in my briefcase for mm, probably 15 years of gratitude journal. I have two journals. I have one journal that I just write thoughts and ideas and, you know, whatever's going on in my mind and my heart in one journal. And I try to journal at least, you know, daily if I can, sometimes more than once a day. Sometimes I'll go, you know, days and weeks without writing. But my gratitude journal, the practice that I have is to actually write down three things that I'm grateful for every day. And it's it's simple, you know, many people listening, you probably, Oprah talked about it for years, many years ago. She interviewed a woman on her show called named Sarah, named Sarah Von Braunick who had written a book called Simple Abundance. And she had this idea of keeping a gratitude journal as a way to sort of prime our mind for good things. And it really has impact if we do it. You know, another thing that I love to do is just ask people the question, what are you grateful for? You know, if you call my office, and this has also been, at least we've had this on the office voicemail for 15 years um, or more, is, hey, thanks for calling. Sorry we missed you, blah, 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 you know, all the normal stuff. But then in your les- in your message, let us know something you're grateful for. Hmm. And like, it's cool, right? People leave really cool. They'll be like, oh, boy, I wasn't prepared for that question. Let me see. Um, um, I'm grateful for my kids or I'm grateful for my health or I'm grateful for my job or whatever they say. And the, what I've noticed in asking the question and now, I mean, anybody, if anybody follows me on social media, at least once a week, if not more on Facebook, on Twitter, I'll post that question. What are you grateful for in this moment? And what I've learned about that, asking that question in person with people on the phone, you know, voicemail on social media is my intention in doing it is I want to remind people to stop and pause and focus on what they're grateful for. But it's also self-serving because when I ask the question, I have to stop and pause and think of it myself. I also get to go back if I'm just scrolling through the comments on Facebook as an example, or if I listen to the voicemail, when people express their gratitude, it reminds me to focus on what I'm grateful for. So Gratitude is a practice. It's like exercise. It's like eating healthy. It's like, you know, brushing your teeth, if you will. It's not a thing that we just do. You know, we sit around at Thanksgiving and we hold hands and we say, I'm thankful for, which is great at practice. But like, why don't we do that in the middle of May or, you know, just because it's Tuesday night and we want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I've I've seen in a lot of your work, you know, talk about authenticity or vulnerability. These, um, I guess, fairly fairly prevalent concepts out there right now in our current society. I guess I want to hear your take on those and how do we cultivate that in ourselves? Yeah, it's big. I mean, you know, one of the things, you know, so my new book, Bring Your Whole Self to Work, I talk about the first principle is about being authentic. The second principle has to do with appreciation and gratitude, which we were just talking about. But this idea, the way that I define authenticity is I I call it the authenticity equation, that it's honesty minus self-righteousness. So we got to remove our self-righteousness plus vulnerability. So we got to add vulnerability. 
So if you think of it in an equation, like honesty minus self-righteousness plus vulnerability equals authenticity, right? And so what's self-righteousness? Self-righteousness is I'm right, you're wrong. And we got a ton of that going on in our world right now, right? I'm right, you're wrong. And when I'm, and the thing is, is maybe on social media or on cable news, people yell at each other and like, you're wrong, you're an idiot. But in li- in real life, that's not usually how it goes down when we're face to face with people at work, in life, at the family gathering. I mean, we usually are more passive aggressive about it. You say, okay, fine. Okay. Maybe we don't say anything, but like in our minds, it's like, nope, he's wrong. And in fact, if I get really fired up about it, he's wrong, he's an idiot. And then I leave the conversation or the interaction and then I go find other people and go, you know what he said? Can you believe that? He's an idiot, right? And now we start building up this separation between each other. And in groups, I see this in organizations all the time, the teams I work with, there's all this self-righteousness going on. And so the thing is, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have strong opinions, we shouldn't speak our mind, not at all, but there's a difference between self-righteousness and conviction. Self-righteousness is I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. Right. It's I'm going to turn the channel and go find the people who I agree with. and I'm going to listen to them. Right now. Conviction is I believe this to be true. I'm willing to speak up about it. I'm even willing to engage, argue, debate, discuss it. And I'm going to like hold my ground. I'm going to speak up, but I'm going to have enough self-awareness and enough humility to realize, you know what? I might be wrong. Or at the very least, there might be another way to see this thing that I can't currently see. So can we be honest? And it takes courage to be honest, but can we remove the self-righteousness from our honesty? Because all of us have had the experience in life and we were convinced we were right about something only to realize in hindsight, oh, I was actually wrong. So if we can remember that in the moment and then vulnerability, I love Dr. Brene Brown's definition of vulnerability. And she says vulnerability is emotional exposure, risk, and uncertainty. Hmm. Emotional exposure, risk, and uncertainty. Think about that. Can you think of anything meaningful or important that you've ever accomplished or experienced in your life, personally or professionally, that did not involve emotional exposure, risk, or uncertainty. Mm-hmm. I can't I think, think of so. anything. Yeah. I mean, not if it really. I mean, there's things that don't matter that much that don't involve those. But if it really matters to you, right? It's meaningful. It's important. An accomplishment, an experience, a relationship, a goal, anything. It's going to involve those things. In fact, in a lot of cases. Right. And you know this because you ask people to tell you their stories. Those pivotal moments in life almost always involve all three of those things. Yeah. Right. So the thing about vulnerability is so can we can we remove the self-righteousness from our honesty and can we add vulnerability, consciously choose to be vulnerable, which is hard to do for most of us as human beings. I mean, even me who writes about it and speaks about it knows how important it is in the moment of being vulnerable, like every other human being, I feel uncomfortable. I, there's there's a part of my being that wants to move away from that discomfort. But another thing that, that Dr. Brene Brown likes to say that I love is choose courage over comfort. And when we choose courage over comfort, what we often get is more confidence, right? We're, we're that much more yeah. brave. It doesn't mean everything's always going to work out. It doesn't mean it's a, you know, some perfect recipe to never fail. In fact, no, it's more inviting the failure. And so I think you know, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I love sports, I mean, I was an athlete for all those years, but one of the reasons I love watching sports and I've been a huge sports fan my whole life is now, and again, some people listening may hate sports and don't really, I get it. But like the thing about sports that I really appreciate in athletes is it's so vulnerable. They put themselves out there. Now, granted, you know, they, some, in some sports, of course, they make a lot of money and they get a lot of attention and some of them can do things. Sometimes we all look and go, what the heck, is, what is that? However, when you think about it, there's no, there's hardly any other job. I mean, maybe politics, maybe, you know, entertainers, uh, you know, but there's hardly any other job where you go and if you go out and like, you're really, really good, you're like at the top, you're the one of the best, you often, even at the, as the best will lose and fail publicly and hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, and in some cases, millions of people will have very strong opinions about what you just did and they'll let you know. Hmm. Right. So, I mean, people are yelling yeah. and screaming and booing and all kinds of stuff. And people feel completely justified and emboldened to do that because like, you know what? He plays for the football team in my town or he whatever. She's on the WNBA team. I, I get to root and cheer and boo. And, and that's fine. That's part of the deal. But it's like they're putting hmm. themselves out there. It's the same way I really appreciate artists of all kinds. Yeah. You know, it's like it takes a lot of courage to put your art out in the world. And I'm not. I'm not an artist, you know, I've now in the last few years started to embrace myself as a creative person, but I don't paint, I don't sing, I don't make films and take photos and, you know what I mean, like, 
but people that do that and have that creativity and that, you know, artistic talent and then put it out for us to enjoy or not judge often, mm-hmm. you know, so those things take a lot of courage and it's the embodiment in a lot of ways of vulnerability. Isn't that very similar to book writing though and putting your books out there? If you really put yourself into there and your thoughts, it's a piece of you out there, oh, Mike. <laughs> you, know, you ain't kidding, man. Well, here's the thing. So like here I am book number four, right? I mean, bring your whole self to work just came out. It's like, I feel really good and excited about it. I'm proud of it. I, I love putting my work out in the world in some ways, but in other ways, it's like, oh God, every time I do it, it's like, what was I thinking? This is terrible because there is that, like I write and speak in a very open, transparent, vulnerable way about my life and my experience. And each of my four books has been that way that I'm simultaneously really excited to put it out there. And at the same time, it's kind of in a different way, but like back when I was playing baseball, I used to have that feeling. I loved pitching. It was really fun for me. I was pretty good at it. It was exciting. I loved it when it was my night to pitch. I'd get all ready and excited. And then right before the game would start almost every time from all the way back from little league, all the way up until I was playing professionally, I would usually have some moment where I would sit ball by myself. I've already warmed up, ready to go. And I, and I'd be thinking to myself, I don't want to go do that. Like right in it because like I'm about to go out there on the pitcher's mound and I could fail miserably in front of everybody. (laughs) This could go really bad. And most of the time it went pretty well. Sometimes it went really well. Sometimes it went terrible. Sometimes it was okay. But, you know, I couldn't control the outcome. Right. Which is like Mm. life. Yeah. But but at the same time, look, I would rather go out there and pitch and fail. than not pitch. As an example, I mean, I don't pitch anymore, but it's like I'd rather put my books and my work out there in the world and have them fail miserably or people say this is stupid and terrible and awful and he's an idiot. I mean, all of that doesn't feel good if I hear any of that. But like that's where, you know, if you use if you use sports as an analogy, like the the game happens on the field or on the court or on the ice or on whatever, you know, the pitch, whatever sport we want to talk about in the pool. I mean, you know, you name it. The game happens when you actually jump in and play and you can win and you can lose and you can look great and you can look terrible and you can have fun or it can be miserable. But like the game doesn't happen on the bench and it definitely doesn't happen sitting in the stands or watching it on TV, you know, and that all the way back to like a question you asked a little bit ago about what's most important. Like I really think we as a culture need to take a look and we as individuals need to take a look at ourselves. Where am I sitting in the stands commenting on the game instead of actually getting in and playing? Hmm. You know, like, like, I mean, just as politics, I have a lot of strong political opinions as do most people. And nowadays think the environment here in the U S and around the world is super intense about politics. But like, really, do I want to just sit around and like whine and complain and judge and criticize as I'm like watching cable news or do I'm going to like pick up the phone and call my representatives? Am I going to like go get engaged in my local community? What can I do to actually be a force for good and make a positive difference? Yeah, it's a good. Point. Right. I'm, you know, and again, I'm not saying this sort of self-righteously and like, that's what we should. But like we could do that. And it's a heck of a lot easier just to like make some nasty comment on social media about something we don't agree with. Yeah. Well, I, I think I probably make the case too. It, it, with technology, technology now, we probably have a greater ability to make some kind of real positive impact. So to sit back Absolutely. on our hands and complain more now seems. Um, I remember kind of thinking about your your Ethiopian story that the perspectives. There's even more opportunity now. There's even more realiza- or maybe lack of realization of, of what opportunity lies before us. Completely. Well, and that's one of the things. I mean, look, I, I think the internet and social media in particular. I mean, look, technology is amazing. And it's dangerous, like a lot of things, right? It's like amazing. Here you and I are having this conversation. You're sitting in your place in Texas. I'm sitting in my place in California. We're just talking over the computer and like, it's amazing. And people are now listening to this on devices anywhere in the world. They can access this conversation. That's like, if, if you would, if my dad came back to life, he died in 2001 and I, my dad was in radio for most of his life and his Mm. career. And I explained to him, like, Dad, I have, like, broadcast quality microphone and headset in my office that plugs into my computer that I can talk to people and record an interview, and then it gets broadcast anywhere on all kinds of devices and different platforms. Like, my dad's head would explode. Yeah. Right? He would be like, what are you talking? Like, that sounds insane. I don't (laughs) even know what you're talking about, right? But so there's that. And there's all of, you know, and at the same time, there's, like, crazy weird stuff happening on the Internet all the time. There's all kinds, you know. You want you want to ever just like 
read the comments on like YouTube videos or on like local news websites. And I just every now and again, I'll do it just as an and as an experiment. And it's like, man, people really have time and energy to say all those nasty things about someone they don't even know. Or maybe <laughs> they do. I, it's like what what? Look, it, look, and I'm not trying to be all holier than that. I sometimes have really nasty opinions and thoughts in my mind. And every now and again, they come out of my mouth and I'll say them. I don't usually put them on the Internet, but that's just me. That being said, it's like, what what do we really want to put out in the world? And so I think we have to be mindful of the fact we have so much opportunity, to your point, of what we can do, what we can say, and how it can go. And the cool part about the Internet, and particularly social media, is it's it has leveled the playing field in a sense that like anybody and everybody has a voice, can say things, can share things, and it has the potential. Now, it's not that often, but it has the potential to reach hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, right? Mm. And But at the same time, we have a responsibility because I can sit in front of my computer all day on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on whatever, and just spout off all kinds of negativity and lies and crazy stuff. And you know what I mean? So it's like, I heard Deepak Chopra years ago say the internet is like a perfect metaphor of human consciousness, you can go from the most beautiful and sublime to the most despicable and disgusting very quickly. Huh. <laughs> yeah, no, you remind me of, I've always been fascinated by, by computer viruses. Yes. In the sense that this is, this is, this is a world we created and what do we do as humans? We create destruction and chaos right within it. As soon as this, it, almost as soon as we start making it, we're like, okay, it can't all be good. We gotta, we gotta put some more chaos and destruction in it as well. And it's always kind of fascinated me in that, in that way. It is. It is fascinating. <laughs> it's really fascinating. But I think again, back to the authenticity piece, like people ask me questions a lot. You know, my second book that came out like nine years ago is called be yourself. Everyone else has already taken it's all about authenticity. So for at least a decade now, I have focused a lot of my work on authenticity and people often ask me the question about do I think the internet and particularly social media is helped or hindered us be authentic and I'm like well I think it's kind of a little bit of both on the one hand again I think it's like there is an opportunity to speak up and speak your mind and share your thoughts and sometimes people are more willing to be open and honest and authentic you know in an email on a blog post on a Facebook post or whatever right mm -hmm. and then on the other hand I also think just like in life, we take on personas. I think online we take on personas, right? Yeah. And yeah. and we all have to take a look at that. Like, what's my persona? That what's, what's the avatar of me, so to speak, the representative that I put out there in the world? My friend Glennon Doyle likes to say we send our representatives out to meet other people's representatives as opposed to really the real, the real us showing up and being there you know, and connecting with people in an authentic way. So I, I, you know, and I don't know what, I don't know what we do. I mean, I, I travel a bit for my work and I'm out around speaking and I'm in airports a lot of times looking around and I'm doing it just like everybody else. Like nobody's even looking at each other. We're just staring at our phones. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking, man, if, if we went back in time, 20 years, people would be reading newspapers. They'd be like standing in line for the payphone. You know, they'd be having conversations, they'd be reading. I, I don't know what, I don't even, I, I barely remember. Like, what was it like before we had these smartphones in particular where we're like, and there's so much, right? It's it's both amazing and just mind-blowing how much content and information I can access on this little thing that I stick in my pocket. And at the same time, it's crazy-making because it just never ends, right? It's a Pandora's box of yeah. distraction. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is a different world in, in many ways. You know, as I've you know talked to people, and one thing that that came out of my season one is the, I, I guess the, the personal story that we all have, and and my feeling that that's untapped. It's an untapped resource for many of us. And yes. I guess I'm curious on on your take on that. You know, from the work that you've done and all the studying and and the book writing you've done, how does our own personal story tie into that, or does it, or how do you see that? It's huge. I mean, and I love that you're doing this and, and, and really focusing on people's personal stories because I believe, especially in our, in our technologically obsessed world, and again, the technology is amazing, but at the end of the day, the, the design of it a lot is to connect us more as human beings. And there's nothing, I think, more human that connects us than our personal story. And I've seen this over the years, right? So this, this whole idea of bringing your whole self to work, which is what my new book is about, is really about how do you create the environment, create the conditions where individuals and teams can thrive. And what I've learned, there was a, a study that Google did a few years back called Project Aristotle. They were looking at trying to figure out 
you know, they're always looking for how do we get better and how do we optimize our success? Because they're one of the most successful companies on the planet and have grown incredibly, you know, rapidly and in, in this sort of remarkable way. And that Google's been a client of mine for years. And I, I, I really admire a lot of what they do, both business wise and in terms of people. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that they were looking at for this Project Airstyle, they were trying to solve for what are the conditions that create high performance for teams? And they first started just studying within Google. They looked at what do our high-performing teams do that are not as high-performing teams? You know, what's the difference? And then they realized, you know what? We should expand this out. So it's not just about Google. It's really look at what do other teams do in other industries, look at some data, look at, the, you know, the studies that are out. And they spent three years studying this. And when they were done with their three-year study, they came up with sort of five key principles, five key conditions that were essential for high performance. And the number one most important condition was what they call psychological safety. And what psychological safety basically is, is trust at a group level. It means I feel safe in this team, in this group that I can be myself. I can disagree with someone. I can take a risk. I can fail and fall flat on my face and I can do all these things. I can dissent. We, you know, we can have conflict and I'm not going to get kicked out of the group. I'm not going to get, Oh, well that's going to be used against me. I'm going to get reprimanded. So this sense of like, And I say all that because I think one of the things that I've seen, Jason, over the years when I go in and work with teams and groups inside of organizations in particular is that when people tell their story, right, there's an exercise that I do with groups and I love doing this exercise and I always start. And again, if it's just a a group, a team that works together, sometimes if it's a larger workshop or if even I'm giving a big keynote speech with a lot of people, I will sometimes put people in small groups or even pair people up. But I love to do it actually with just a group of, you know, 10, 12 people all on the same team. And the way the exercise goes is I always start and we've already talked about, you know, authenticity and vulnerability. And I've sort of explained some of that. But I say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go around the table and everyone's going to have about two minutes to talk. I'm going to go first. And here's what we're when it's your turn. Just repeat this phrase. If you really knew me, you'd know this about me. Hmm. And I said, look, it's not about in this moment, I I actually tell them it's not about telling us your life story necessarily. It's more about telling us the story of what's really happening for you right now. And the metaphor I use is the metaphor of the iceberg. And I say, so if you lowered the waterline on your iceberg and you revealed a little more of what's going on, what you're thinking, how you're feeling, what's really happening in your life, in your world, with your job right now, what would we really know? And I always start and I just, you know, it's not something I prepare. It's just in if they really knew me right in that moment, here's what they would know. And I share that as openly and vulnerably as I possibly can to try to make it as safe as possible. So then the next person goes and the next person goes. And sometimes even if it's a really tense environment, even if a team I'm working with doesn't have a ton of psychological safety that exists on the team before I walk in there, just that conversation alone a lot of times can have a profound impact because what basically people are doing is They're telling their story. They're in the moment story. Another activity that I've seen teams do a lot that more is about personal stories is they have people come and share what they call, you know, their journey line or their story. Right. And they'll bring in slides and they'll have photos from when they were a kid. And but again, what I've seen is, again, the more personal we get, the more personal we're willing to get. Ironically, the more universal it is Hmm. because I'll be sometimes halfway around the world in a room full of people that don't look anything like me that speak a different language, that come from a different place, that have different customs, that like, I literally am like, I don't know what, you know, I'm in Japan right now. I'm in India right now. I'm in somewhere in Europe. And I'm like, I don't, but I, when I lower my waterline and I start getting real about my own experience as a human being, and then other people start doing, what I start to notice is, oh, the natural human response to vulnerability is empathy. Hmm. You start hearing someone's story. And even if the story itself is super different than your story, what's not different is the emotional experience of it. Because what's infused in all of our stories, joy, pain, excitement, sadness, right? Insight and wisdom, difficulty, fear, all of that. The whole spectrum of human experience, right, is in our story. And when we share our story authentically, I'm like, wow, your story is way different than my story. But you know what? there's a lot of feelings in your story that are the same feelings in my story. Mm-hmm. That's where we have all that common ground. No, that's a really good point. Cause it got, you got me thinking about this thought that was on my mind recently. 
um, basic people, you know, clamoring for, hey, we need to sh- essentially a lot of what you're talking about. We need to show our authentic selves more. And one yes. of my thoughts of that is like, yeah, we should, we should. But that also creates a place, or at least my mind, it creates more diversity out in the world. Because if I'm truly myself and everybody else is being more true them, to themselves, yep. there's a lot more differences out there. But what I hear you saying is like, that may be true, but with our story, there's there's almost a more powerful uniting factor. And it, well, here's the, I agree. And here's the paradox, I think. I mean, again, you and I were talking a little bit about this before we hit record, but this there's so much energy and attention that's being placed in our culture right now around diversity, right? Mm-hmm. And issues of gender and race and orientation and all these things. And there's a lot of um, passion. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot there's and a lot of debate and discussion and it's political and it's emotional and it's all right. Now, look, everybody has their own thoughts and feelings about this. One of my core beliefs, and I've seen this over the years prior to doing the work that I've done for the last 17 years, just growing up, but then definitely in these last many years. The paradox is this. We are all really different. Even if we like, you know, like you and I are almost the same age, right? And we're both men. And right, I mean, even if we have things about us, I could look at someone who's the same race as me, the same gender, the same age, grew up in the same place. And then like our beliefs, our thoughts, our ideas, our opinions, our personalities, like, whoa, we're way different. Even though my two people might, they might look at two of us standing next to each other and go, those guys are like identical, right? Yeah. So we're super different. And then you get a room full of people, and especially here in the United States and other places in the world where it's just like, Oh my gosh, or somewhere like, like where I live in California, there's just like people from every possible background you could imagine. So you see all the diversity. And simultaneously, I think it's really important that we try to understand and appreciate and have empathy for other people's experiences and realize, wow, not everybody's like me. Not everyone looks like me, thinks like me, comes from where I come, all of that. Paradoxically, I think the further down below the waterline we go on that iceberg, the more similar we become. Mm. And the challenge I think we have right now in in our world, but also just as human beings, is how do we hold those two paradoxes? That on the one hand, yes, we're different. Yes, it's important to understand the difference and appreciate the difference and have empathy and awareness and try to be as inclusive as possible. And at the same time, without minimizing or discounting the difference and what all that means, understand that as humans, we're way more alike than we are different. And a lot of what I focus on, a lot of what I believe and what I wrote about and bring your whole self to work is like, how do we really create that as an authentic experience that people get? Oh my gosh. Look, cause the truth of the matter is if we talk about any kind of separation, I mean, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, all the isms or just separation amongst people for justifiable reasons. Cause I don't like her. I don't disagree or I disagree with him or whatever. We lose a sense of connection with that other person, right? It gets self-righteous. We get scared. We get angry, We whatever. And we put up that wall, that barrier. And then it's like, there's me and there's you, there's us and there's them. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that, and we all do it for different reasons. And sometimes we do it just because it feels safer that way to do it that way. The problem with that is that we forget that they are us and we are them. Right. And that's the challenge, I think, in a real way, not in a corny, cliched, like bumper sticker kind of way, but in a real way to like, I keep saying this and have been for the last few years. And this actually, it, but in this idea that like, we're all in this thing together. And, and I, I, you know, that to me is the essence of teamwork of collaboration, right? Like the final chapter of bring your whole self to work is called create a championship team, sort of using my sports background, but it's really about how do you create that environment, whether it's at home with your family whether it's at work with the people you work with, whether it's in your community, whether it's even in the larger community, it's like, hey, you know what? We're all in this thing together. I may disagree with you. I may not like you. I may see the, the world very differently. I may have different values and beliefs, but like, we're in this thing together. Yeah. That's powerful. I mean, that's a powerful way to unite. Um, yeah. Mike, I want to make sure that um, people can uh, connect with you and, and hear about your book and stuff. Where, where's the best place to do that? The best place to do that is on my website, which is mike-robbins.com. And with the new book, Bring Your Whole Self to Work Out, there's a page on the site. If you go to mike-robbins.com slash work, you can find out more about the book. And there's different links there where you can buy it from the different you know, online sellers and all that stuff. But one of the coolest parts about that page is for everybody who gets the book, you get access to some free audios that I recorded specifically for people who are like owners or entrepreneurs 
or if you happen to be like a manager or leader inside your company, wherever you work, or if you happen to be more of an individual contributor, I actually recorded hour long audios for each of those particular groups or where people find themselves in their career so they could take what's in the book, but also apply it very directly to the role or the type of work that they do. Okay. Mike, I want to thank you for, for sharing time and, and a lot of great insights in there and things to think about. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to going back and, and listening to this again and, and and just pondering on some of these these concepts that you shared with us. But I want to give you the last word here before we part. Um, any last thing you'd like to share that we may, may have missed? <laughs> well, first, let me just say thank you for having me on. I appreciate your questions and the conversation. And I think the one thing I would say in the midst of all of this, whether we're talking about bringing our whole selves to work or you know, connecting with people that may seem different or not different than us, I also just think it's really important for us to be kind and compassionate to ourselves because I really believe like we don't actually see other people as they are. We see them as we are. So the kinder and more compassionate we are with ourselves, the kinder and more compassionate we tend to be with other people. Hmm. Very good. You you mind make me feel, I just had a parenting flash in my mind as I'm, you know, disciplining my kids. I'm like, Hmm, I think I'm disciplining myself. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. There's that. There's that. (laughs) Well, Mike, Again, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for spending time with us on Story Hinge. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you all for sharing time with uh, myself and Mike. And, Mike, thank you again for coming on Story Hinge. Uh, just a thought or two on leaving. Oh, if you want to connect with Mike, you can find him at MikeRobbins.com. That link will be in the show notes and also on the website. So MikeRobbins.com. And, you know, I think I'll just end with a, kind of a question and put this out here. I've done this exercise, and it's um, it's pretty useful. I think Mike brought this up. And it's a concept of basically if you didn't have to earn money, and maybe some of you are lucky enough out there that don't have that. I don't, I don't know that feeling. But if you didn't have to earn money, what would you do? This kind of this is another a thought on getting to the passion or things you really, really want. And to to let go of some of that, that, that resistance, you say, well, I can't do this, or this wouldn't be um, this wouldn't be beneficial or it wouldn't be profitable. If you, if you had enough money, you could live and you didn't have to worry about that. What would you do? See if you can't take a step towards that somehow. You know, for me, this podcast and, and talking and working through ideas, uh, research has been part of that journey. And I could say that, you know, on a personal level, it's been very, very fruitful, very beneficial, um, a lot of growth in it. And so I just want to leave that thought with you guys out there to to think about that, to to try that exercise and see if you can't even incorporate that into your life a little bit. Um, many of us don't have that opportunity to go full time into to something we really want to do. Um, we have a responsibilities and obligations, and and that's okay. But if we could take a little time to do a little bit more of that in our lives, that's my my invitation to you all out there for this week. Again, thank you. I invite you to check out the website and at storyhinge.com and be sure to subscribe, share this podcast with others and also check out 73 mentors, subscribe and, and check that one out as well. And let me, let us know on your feedback. There's contact pages on both the websites for those to, to let us know what you think. And you guys have a great week. We will catch you in two weeks this time. All right. Bye now. Thank you for sharing with us at story hinge. We hope this time together has added more goodness to your journey. Until next time, onward and upward, and may your own story continue to grow more beautiful.